it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 170 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Phantom Coffee Roasters. Holly, and what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today we're drinking the bright and beautiful Brazilian coffee. And we all know I like Brazilian. Let's drink more. It's strong. It's good. And where can everybody get this Brazilian coffee? Bantamroasters.com. And use the code FLUFFYBUTT for 10% off anything you buy on the website. It's a great code. Go use it and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some of this Brazilian coffee and chat? I am, but first a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us in Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing? Pretty good. How about you? Finally starting to feel like myself. Like every day I get a little stronger. I've still got the fatigue. I still got the cough, but every day it gets a little bit better. Well, that's good. I still don't have my voice back all the way, but I think it's a little better. It's like, it's been weeks. And the thing is COVID is no joke. If you get it badly, you get it badly. And it it can knock you off your rocker for a while. Yes, it can. Not a good thing. Last night I was watching TV and Everybody who's listened to us, I don't know, I think I've said it a few times, but I'm an E.T. junkie. If you're an E.T. junkie and you're listening to this, put your hand up. E.T. being entertainment tonight? Yes, it's like a guilty pleasure of mine. Like, I watch it all the time. Everybody in the household is like, do we have to watch this? I'm like, yeah, I like it. So last night I was watching it, and I don't know if anybody else is out there and you watch it, but you saw the Oprah's turning 70 and her and Gail, and they showed their whole friendship of 47 years. Well, I thought about you because we've been friends for 42 years, Holly Ann, 42 years. We're coming up on it. I know. We're almost as long as Gail and Oprah. Well, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing myself silly when they go, they showed them on their road trips and I was like, oh yeah, it's kind of like that. Your road trips are kind of like our road trips. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Qdoba. That's all I got to say. But no, I did think about you because I was like, man, we've been friends almost as long as Gail and Oprah. I mean, that's a long time, man. Well, they met when they were adults. We met as kids. So we're going to overtake them. We're going to overtake them eventually. It's true. (laughs) And the funny thing is, they met in Baltimore, which everybody knows that's where we're from, born and bred in Baltimore. It's true. Oprah was a a young reporter for WJZ News, and Gail was the production person that worked, and they met. Interesting. Now, do either Oprah or Gail keep chickens? I wish, because then we would have them on the show. That would be great. We had to talk chickens with Oprah. (laughs) We can talk chickens with pretty much anybody. (laughs) We definitely can. We definitely can. So yeah, that was my thing I was watching last night thinking about it, but... I'm feeling a little bit better. I feel like I can laugh a little bit more. I can laugh without coughing a little bit more. So that's good. Yeah. Still have it, but getting better. Over here, we're still doing, you know, the normal stuff around the farm, but our spring schedule has suddenly exploded. We're busy. We're really busy. And so I'm all of a sudden I'm running and putting fires out and trying to keep up with everything. We wouldn't have it any other way. It's the way it is. Now, here's the thing. If you are interested, I'm going to just put this out there right now. There is a post on our Facebook page with a link that goes out to the Backyard Chicken Summit. This year, our talk for the Chicken Summit is crop health. And that's one of the major problems with chickens that come up that you're going to face. It really is. Yeah. We talk for a while and we give lots and lots of information in our presentation. It's free. 
go to our Facebook page. I put the link up today, but it's out there now when you listen. And I'll have it up a few more times and hit that link. And it's free for the three days. If you watch it live, it's free. Right. So just make sure that, you know, you go on. It's March 4th, 5th, and 6th. Holly Ann's going to be manning the ship for us because I will be in Mexico. Thank you, Holly Ann. Some people. (laughs) All I can say is you better bring me home something really nice from Mexico. With the chicken on it? Yes. (laughs) You can bring me some avocados too. Yeah. (laughs) But yes, I will be answering all the questions for the hour after the presentation. Lots of crop stuff. Right. And, you know, go over there and register because there's a lot of great speakers. You know, one of our big time friends of the show, one of our best friends of the show, Fiona Osborne, is going to be there. Another friend of the show, Lisa Steele, is going to be on there. So go listen to them and their presentations are going to be great. Check them out. It's worth it. It's free. Follow the link. Do what it says. You don't have to pay, but you have to watch it in real time. You can't rewatch it. Then you have to pay. Right. Okay, so on that note, if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. We love to read them. We love to hear what you have to say. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It does two things. You never miss an episode and they count them. So it does amazing things for us. If you're looking for other ways to help support the show, You can tell a few chicken-loving friends about the podcast. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can check out our Etsy shop, t-shirts, mugs, tiny chickens. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. And the thing you can do to help support the show is visit our website and our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good-smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. La 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 cha 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 time for the breeds. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) This week's breed spotlight is the Kubalaya. Oh, yeah. We're partying it up like in the Kubalaya stuff. Is that what that was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I w- I'm going to start off this breed spotlight by saying nowhere under the sun can I find the correct pronunciation of Kubalaya. So we're saying Kubalaya. We're, so we're saying Kubalaya. It could be <laughs> Kubalaya. It could be oh, no. Kubalaya. I don't know. But no, I, is what I, we're like, going with. I like Kubalaya. I know what you like, but what you like isn't necessarily the correct pronunciation. Oh, I don't care. It's going to be right. And everybody's going to be saying, I have a Kubalaya and a watermelon chicken. That's what they're going to be saying. 
I hope not together. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. The beautiful Kubalaya is an unusual semi-long-tailed breed that was developed in Cuba. Cuba, yeah. Now, I said semi-long tail because their tails aren't as long as the Yokohama or the Phoenix or some of the Japanese long tail breeds, but their tail feathers can reach the ground. That's pretty long when it comes to tail feathers. If they're yeah. reaching the ground and they're dragging, that's pretty it's long. It's not like, you know, you've seen the photos of the Japanese Nagadori where the feathers are like yards long. It's not like that. Or even the Yokohama, not that long, but again, they can reach the ground. Now, the Kubalayas are a rare heritage breed, and they are currently listed as critically endangered by the Livestock Conservancy. Oh, no. Yeah. That's not good. No. They are found in the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection under the All Other Breeds category. When we talked about, I think we did the presentation for last year's Chicken Summit, we did take the breeds and put them into different categories. What we essentially put them in their various classes. Exactly. And all other breeds is a category. It's everything that doesn't fit into anything else they put in, in this. Including the Americanas, the Aracanas, and the Turkins. They don't have a good category to fit in. So they just say all others. Right. And there you go. And that's Sultans the category too. that they're in. Sultans are in there too, I think. Yes, I believe so. The Kubalayas were largely developed in the 1800s. In earlier decades, Spanish and British sailors had brought chickens to Cuba that probably originated in the Philippines and some of the other Asian islands. Much of what they brought were game birds or game types. These game birds were crossed with Sumatras and Malays and some other birds of that stature. And then they were selectively bred to develop what would eventually become the Kubalaya. I mean, the Sumatras have the long tails, too. So, yes, I mean, that's kind of where that comes from. Right. You can see with these different birds how this is turning into this breed of chicken. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you had told me that this bird was nothing but Malays and Sumatras, I would believe you. Yeah. I mean, looking at them, that's what you see. Right. Now, at some point, they may have been used as fighting birds, though their unusual spurs could make that difficult. We're going to talk about their spurs more later. Boo but, hiss. Let's go back. Boo hiss. But I, it I happened. Think at, I think at a certain point that stopped because I think the breed moved into a place where they really weren't fighting birds anymore. Right. But when you think about all these sailors that were bringing these birds. Oh, yeah. That's what they were doing with them was yes. fighting them. Unfortunately, it's a part of our history that happened. I don't like to think about it, but it happened. And that's why the majority of these birds were game birds coming over because that's what they were doing. That's exactly right. And we're going to fast forward a little bit. We're going to go to Cleveland, Ohio in 1939. Cleveland hosted the World's Poultry Congress. It was the seventh Congress ever held, and it was the first to take place in the U.S. Now, this is kind of an astonishing number. Over 380,000 people attended this Congress. Wow. And a lot of birds. So among the birds were the Kubalaya, and it was the first time the breed had been shown in the U.S., Cuban people migrating from Cuba to the U.S. did bring Kubalayas with them. So they were most likely found in various regions in the southern U.S. and had been here for a while. Right. But that was the first time they actually were in a poultry ship. Some of the Kubalayas at the Congress were probably sold. That gave the breed a deeper reach into the U.S. I don't think they ever became like super popular. No, and they're known for being in Florida. I mean, that's basically right. where they're known for being because right. that's where they came over from Cuba there. Yes. So, I mean, this isn't a bird. And again, being critically endangered is because when they came over to Florida, they didn't go much further, right? right. They stayed right in that area and the availability of the chicken wasn't there. Right. So that's where we are now still. So we've got to get them out there. The Kubalaya was accepted into the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1939, in three color varieties. Okay, so let's do the black, the white, and the black crested red. There are a few more unrecognized color varieties, including a very pretty Wheaton and the silver and gold duckwing. There are also bantam kubalayas. And honestly, as I looked, they seem to be way easier to get than the standard size kubalaya. 
they must be adorable. Oh, can you imagine a tiny chicken with a long tail? Oh my God. That I would have me some bantam kubalayas, and that's the truth. Now you could have the bantam kubalayas, kubalayas and the watermelon chickens together because they'd be banthams together. I still would not go down that road. Really? Yes. And you'll find out why in just a bit here. Okay. So let's go into kind of what they look like. They're small bodied. The roosters are weighing in at four and a half to six pounds while the hens are coming in to three to four pounds. They stand tall and proud with clean, strong legs, a sloping back and a long downward sloping full and spread out tail. We know they got a big tail. The shape of the tail is referred to as the lobster tail. Apparently, it's supposed to be reminiscent of the shape of a lobster's claw. Okay, I can kind of see that. So they lobster have a, tail? Yeah, they have a long neck, a small pea comb, small waddles, and small red earlobes. And we know that that's bred into them from the game birds. That's, yeah. They're also into a very warm environment. And also, that gaming bird, they don't want combs and waddles. Right. Okay. So the black cubalias have a slate colored legs and feet while the other colors have white legs. So they have to have a little bit of difference in there. They have tight feathers and what fluff they have is fairly compact, which tells us they have to be in a warm environment or provisions have to be made for them if they're not. The roos are often spurless. Now we were talking about this earlier because they were used to fight, but without spurs, it's pretty unfair. I don't think they would have been put in that situation. I think the either the spurlessness or the triple spur came about later. If later. they were used as fighting birds early on, there's no way they would have. It, it would have been unfair. That's what I'm worked. saying. It That's would not have saying. worked. No, it would have been horrible, man. That's yes. what I'm saying. So the very pretty Kubalaya hens are respectable layers. Okay. They're going to give you 150 to 180 plus small, medium cream colored eggs per year. And they're in my, yes, respectable, average to respectable. Well, generally, when you're talking about these kinds of birds, like the long tailed breeds and some of the other, I know we don't use the word ornamental, but that's what people call them. Yeah. Usually they don't lay anywhere near that many. So I thought this was an impressive number. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They will sometimes go broody, which will affect your numbers. So again, if we say a bird's going to have potential to go broody, your numbers might get pumped up if they're one of the the birds in that category that decide, I'm not going broody. So you might get more eggs. Well, that or, might be that might be the difference between the 150 and the 180. Right. 180 exactly. might be a girl who doesn't go broody. Right. Or 180 plus, I mean, it might get more. You never yeah. know. Yeah. So they're Unusual chickens, that's for sure. They really are. They're, They're very friendly with people, some of them developing very strong bonds of affection with human families. But they can be aggressive with other chicken breeds, and it's usually the roosters. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, that's why I'm saying you probably don't want them with a really mixed, docile breed. With a mixed breed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing is, you always look for. Are they going to get along with humans? Because you want to be able to keep them and love them. I saw that over and over that they can be really, really affectionate and very, very bonded with people. It was surprising how often I saw that. So I think it's a very common trait for them to be really used to humans being with them. And the Kupalaya might be one that you have a flock all in itself then, yeah. you know, like just keep a flock of them and keep them separate. And it would be a good conservation breeding program, kind of, get them get going. Unlike a lot of the show breeds, these birds actually do need space and exercise. So they're really not content just to be in a pretty aviary. They really need some stimulation. They want to be outside. They want to be doing the stuff. Right. They can be used as dual purpose, as a dual purpose breed. Okay. We have to say that. We don't always like saying right. it, but I mean, we have to say it. Use, some people do use them that way. Though showing eggs and companionship seems to be pretty much the best job for them. So, yeah. you know, they're going to give you eggs. They're going to give you companionship. If you got the bantam size, you could have a purse chicken that would be really cool with the long tail hanging out. That would be I cool. I just love them. They would make a really gorgeous addition to an experienced chicken lady's flock. And the reason we say experienced is just because of that possibility of other breed aggression. Now, Whenever we do say this, we want to put it out there that we're not saying that you shouldn't get these chickens if you're unexperienced. What we're saying is 
sometimes having a few years under your belt with an easier breed sets you up so that when other things come along, you can handle them a little bit easier. It's just giving yourself time to get used to being a chicken lady and getting used to the things that come along with it. Right. Like you said before, they definitely need help with conservation breeding, no doubt. They are a very heat-hardy breed, and they can handle pretty humid weather. You know, Cuba and Florida, that's what they're going to get. But they will need help in cold climates. I was going to say, for cold. this is a bird that if you're in Florida or somewhere down there, in Georgia, Florida, Alabama, where it stays warm most of the year, this might be a bird for you. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, it might not be a bird. Maybe for not you. so much. I don't think your Kubalais are going to really appreciate popping out of the coop into snow. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, they're pretty like regional. I, this is one bird that comes across when I talk about it. And the first thing that pops into my brain is regional because it's, this is they, a very tropical bird. They went to Florida and they kind of stayed there. And so we need the Floridians out there who want to help with breeding this bird to get themselves some kubalayas. Some yeah. Louisiana chicken keepers too. You could throw a carnival with the kubalayas. Yes, you could do this. Okay, so this is the major question right now. It's on everybody's mind. And after they've heard about the kubalayas and they want to say, what kind of chicken do you have? A kubalaya. Where can they get them? Well, several of the larger hatcheries sell Great Ron Kubalaya Bantam Chicks, including Cackle and Stromberg's. For adult Kubalayas, because I didn't find any, I would try the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory. Oh, man. So you got to get those Bantams out there. That would be so cute. Well, I mean, they're straight run Bantams. So if you're planning to do that, I think your idea of having a separate Kubalaya flock is a very good one. And they're straight run because they need help. They can't. They can't be saying, okay, we're only going to get hens out there. They also need because help. They're small bantams, so it's probably hard to sex them. Yeah. The kubalaya. Now, <laughs> the if, kubalaya. You ha- if you have the kubalaya, send us a picture, put a story on Instagram, and hit that mention button and click on us, and we will reshare and we would love to see them. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. They're back with an innovative new product. You're going to want to check this out. It's an extra large set, a 14-pound feeder in three-gallon water with steep anti-roost lids. They're made of super durable material. You can either stand them on legs or hang them on brackets on your coop or fence. They're easy to remove and clean too. Plus, they look awesome. We personally use Roosties and we're huge fans. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, check out the Roosties store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. UK chicken lovers, this one's for you. Get happy, healthy hens with Eco Nourish's live calci worms. Enrichment, nutrition, and protection in one tasty, sustainable pack. Scientifically proven to support glossy feathers, strong laying and skeletal health, Protect from disease and improve gut health and immunity. You'll also bust flock stress by stimulating natural instincts and get eco bragging rights. Visit econourish.co.uk and use the code COFFEE15 for 15% off your first order. Your chickens and the planet will hug you for it. Okay, so are we ready to move on to main topic? Yeah! Yeah! This week, we have Twain Lockhart and Mark Eggers from Neutrina joining us. We have a fantastic chat about how to feed your chicks and your waterfowl babies. Enjoy. Okay, today we have Mark Eggers and Twain Lockhart from Neutrina joining us. If you haven't listened to Mark and Twain on the show before, Mark is the science side and Twain is the retail side. And they're joining us to talk all things chicken food and chicks today. Fellas, welcome. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having us again. Yeah. Thanks for of having course. us. Of course. And here's it's a little cat. 
Here's a little caveat. If you have not listened to those episodes, go back and listen because <laughs> they were so fun. These guys are so much fun. We laugh a ton and I'm talking a ton. You don't want to miss out. So how have you guys been doing? Really good. No, things are good. Long yeah, winter, we're, we're, it's, it's going fine. Yeah, we're glad that I'm going to say it. When winter is officially over. <laughs> oh, yeah. you dream, we, Rio. We've had, our, we've had our fill of the negative 40 below wind chill, the gloomy gray days. It's 45 degrees today, and winter is over. So, yeah. Not in Wisconsin. <laughs> not in Wisconsin. Mother Nature is still going to try and murder us at least two or three times. So yeah, we've got a ways to go. Yeah, unfortunately, we will, too. It's been a brutal winter for everybody, I feel like. I mean, even in places that normally don't get cold, like in Florida, you're, some of our listeners are telling us 18 degrees. Maria, yep. I'm giving you the shout out. 18 degrees in Tallahassee. What the heck? Raining yeah. iguanas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> not good. Not good. Not no. raining men. It's raining iguanas. <laughs> <laughs> But the iguanas are small enough, the chickens would be really excited about That's that. That's right. Oh, right. my God. That menu. would be. Yeah, you have chickens <laughs> and iguanas running around, a chicken. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> you thought the cicadas were bad. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. Have you eaten cicadas before? No. Have you eaten cicadas? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tell us. Tell us. I, it's they taste like what they're cooked in. I mean, they weren't bad. I mean, uh, I've been known to eat a lot of things. If everybody else is eating it, I'll eat it. Okay, I won't be the first one. I've had possum. I've had uh, deep fried chicken feet. Uh, that was at a, a friend of mine at a Korean wedding, and they we had might those. have to put a beep over that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was afraid you were going to tell us that they tasted like chicken. <laughs> they were crunchy and delicious. I would do this. that again. So, <laughs> oh okay, God. sorry. I, I'll get us chasing rabbits. Over <laughs> I was at the car line to pick up my daughter the other day, and we started talking, my friends and I, about like well, what do you eat if there's nothing left? And I was like, look, what I've learned in the chicken world is grubs are a high protein that you want to eat. That's something that you know. Like, it's not a berry, so you don't know if it's poisonous or not. We would all be like chickens out there digging for those big white grubs. <laughs> <laughs> like, give me the grubs. Give me the grubs. Roasted grubs. Mm -hmm. Oh, yummy. Yummy. <laughs> um, I mean, that's one that you know you can't really go wrong with. You're like, okay, yeah. it's gross, but it's going to be protein and it's going to get me through. Well, I, for one, am glad that we are not reduced to eating grubs yet. <laughs> <laughs> but since we're on the subject of eating things, <laughs> Let's talk about chicks and what they eat, but let's start off. Let's give a quick overview for listeners who don't have chickens yet or are newbies. We have a lot of new people this year. Or somebody who just needs a little, you know, refresher. 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 Yeah. Let's yep. give a quick overview of what you need when you bring those babies home. So from kind of the nutrition side of it, one thing that people kind of forget about right away is water, right? So when you bring those chicks home, that clean, fresh water, that's definitely something that, that is kind of first and foremost. You always want to make sure of that. And then really what a, what a baby chick needs when they first are getting started eating, we think about you want to, something that they're going to readily go eat, right? And then it is the protein, the amino acids, the vitamins and the trace minerals. That's really is what keeps those baby chicks off and, and growing and then keeps them healthy. So what are so, some of those oh, nutrients in that food? Like what are the, yep. the main nutrients that they're going to need? So the main nutrients that they need for just kind of skeletal growth is that's where the calcium and, and phosphorus come into play. And then for that, that muscular growth, and the nervous system and, and all the organs, that's where you're looking at the amino acids. So the protein side of it, the amino acids, the first two that you kind of see on that tag are usually lysine, methionine are the ones you see on the tag. And then sometimes on those tags, you'll see some of those trace minerals like zinc and copper. And then um, kind of with our nature wise, the other thing that we've really found is it has been extremely important 
has been the uh, yeast, and some of that can be so the prebiotic, probiotic, and the postbiotics. So, you know, there you kind of remember the old biotics, and they, they work like probiotics do and to feed those healthy microflora in the gut. And then those essential oils also come into play along with those probiotics to help with uh, keeping pasty butt away. So that's been, that that was our biggest find with the new nature wise with the essential oils and the flock shield that's included in that is that really is what keeps away pasty butt. Fantastic. And then you, then, then you so, think about like probiotics. So that's both in the nature wise and in the country feeds. Uh, so like at the mill, I know they also sell the country feeds chick starter too. And that has, that doesn't have the essential oils in it, but it does have the probiotics and the yeast in there. So when it comes to keeping those chicks healthy, or at least, you know, keeping them alive, that is absolutely the key is those probiotics and yeast. Whereas if you're really worried about the pasty butt side of it, that's where you definitely need to be on the nature wise. So I was going to just talk a little bit about, you know, mother nature. A lot of folks may not realize this. A baby chick, when it hatches, is still absorbing the yolk from the egg. And that's why they they can go three days. So that's why you can ship a bird from the East Coast to the West Coast or vice versa without any food or water. They they do okay with that because they're absorbing that yolk. As amazing as that is, there is a little bit of a downside to that. It produces very sticky poop. Okay. So one of the tips that I always pass on is when your chicks first come in, hydrate them for about six hours before you feed them. And yep. that will help flush that sticky poop out. That along with the nature wise will really help reduce your pasty butt. I'm also, my my wife, we've been burdened chicks for decades. And my wife is very, very, she hardly ever loses a chick. One of her secrets that I share all the time, so it's not much of a secret now, but is we use purified drinking water for yep. the first two or three days, maybe a first week. Now, not distilled. That's a big no-no because there's nothing in that. There's It'll deplete the minerals out of your system too, supposedly. But just a purified drinking water. Tap water has so many variables in it. You know, in your city, we, we ran a feed store for many years and we had tropical fish. And it was tap water. And every once in a while, they would get way too much chlorine in the mm. tap water and it would kill the fish. So imagine what that's doing to your baby chick's gut. So right. chickens are very tough, but uh, as baby chicks are very delicate. So those first few days, that bottled water, some vitamins and electrolytes are a good idea as well. Another common mistake people make, if a little bit's good, doesn't mean a lot's better. Uh, follow the directions. You get too much of that stuff in their water and they don't drink it. Now you have a whole nother set of problems. So those are great points. Excellent. You know, the purified water That's a great thing. Holly and I both are on well water, so we have Mm -hmm. a little bit less of that. But, you know, you know exactly what what they're getting in. And you could put your vitamins and minerals right in the gallon of water and go from there and just mix it all together and make sure they have their electrolytes and all that good stuff in the water. Going to flush out, that's an excellent point. Flushing out that sticky poop. I love that. I the other that. thing now, is watch the grind on your chick starter feed. I don't care what brand I, I'm hoping you're going to use in a train, obviously, but even course. we have it happen once in a while, it's not ground super fine. And especially with Bantams, this is critical. If they're kicking a lot out and they're having trouble eating it, you know, it's very simple. Put it in a coffee grinder. Uh, you may want to clean that coffee grinder out real good. We don't need caffeinated chickens. I can't think of anything less <laughs> that we would need than caffeinated chickens, but uh, or a, a rolling pin and some wax paper, grind it down so it's easy for them to eat. So, Get that frustration uh, out. Like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially with Bantams. This is critical. So. Yeah. Yeah. And Mark, what you were saying, I want to clarify this for everybody out there. There are two chick feeds, correct? So there's country feeds and, yep. na- and nature wise. Both have right. their own chick feed that goes along with them. Yep. And and both of them are really good chick chick starters. Both of them are really well fortified, good, solid nutrition in both of them. But the key difference is somebody maybe that's, uh, you know, kind of watching 
dollars a little bit, or, you know, you want just good nutrition. You normally get along pretty good with your chicks. Country feed can work really well. It's got the, the pre and probiotic. It's got all the amino acids in it. It's a very, very good chick starter. But if you've had experiences with pasty butt before and nobody likes cleaning chick butts, I mean, let's just call <laughs> it what fun. it is. Not fun. Yep, not fun. And NatureWise works really, really well for that. Our NatureWise is our best performing chick starter. Uh, but Country both, Feeds is still a very good chick starter. Do yeah. they both come in medicated and non-medicated feed? So they do. Yeah. Okay. And that's something too that, um, so I, I feed non-medicated. The essential oils in there have worked really well for us. And, you know, we pick up all of our chicks at our local farm store and we have had an issue with sometimes when you pick them up, they've already got pasty but you know if the weather has been rough mm -hmm. you know it's, it's not all the farm stores fault either i mean it can be the 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 weather can be just really rough and the run them through the mail you know to to get them to where they're going that can be hard on those chicks and so the nature wise works really well if you have had a problem in the past with coccidiosis and the chicks have not been vaccinated for coccidiosis, then I would suggest using a medicated chick starter. If you've never had a vet that said you have coccidiosis, maybe it is just pasty butt, right? Then I really don't recommend the medicated feed. And the symptoms, usually the windows, usually two, three weeks until I've seen it as late as 12, 14 weeks the lethargic, they don't feel good. They may be not eating, drinking, but then what screams coccidiosis, they start pooping blood. Exactly. And, and yep. I've been doing chicken so long that I can go someplace and I, I, I know this sounds so weird, but I can actually smell it. I go, oh God, they've got coxy because it has this weird coppery smell in the coop or where they're brooding them. Cleanliness is critical. If you keep yeah. that brooder clean and dry, clean and dry is critical. Your odds of getting coxie go down a lot. Exactly. So, and let's go back to the vaccine. The vaccine is offered through most hatcheries. The coccidiosis right. uh, vaccine is offered. Now, if you're getting them through a farm supply store, you're kind of, you know, whether they had it done before they were shipped or not, it's right. good to ask that question because if they've had the vaccine for coccidiosis, you do not want to give medicated feed because it counteracts the right. vaccine. It counteracts the vaccine. Yep. My so, experience is most farm stores do not vaccinate for coccidiosis. Now, Merrick's is a whole different thing. If it's if, right. and you've got to make sure you clarify with the employees because you might say, are the chicks vaccinated? And they might go, oh, yeah. Well, they're vaccinated for Merrick's. Exactly. Right. Which I'm a I'm a big fan of that. I, I like to see the, the chicks be vaccinated. There's nothing more heartbreaking yeah. than having a family come in and you know it's always their favorite chicken. You know, Betty can't walk, what's going on? It's Merrick's and there's no cure for it. You can vaccinate to prevent it, but you can't cure it. So Betty has a rough life. <laughs> Poor Betty. Yeah, Be Betty is everybody's got a chicken named Betty. So <laughs> Betty you is know, my, my bad or good example. I may have to name one of my little girls Betty that's coming this uh -huh. year because uh, I've never had a Betty and I'm going to dedicate her to you guys, uh, ah, Betty, for sure. And just but, so you know, with your goslings, everybody has a Drake, or not a Drake, a gander named Ryan. So just, <laughs> just so you know. No, I'm only <laughs> <laughs> little Ryan Gosling. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love never it. let me do that. But I'm only getting um, geese. No ganders for us. Geese only. Like, oh, my so Lord. So you say. <laughs> so, exactly. See, Dwayne's starting to know how this works. He's uh -huh. starting to know us really well. And exactly. Way to go. Virtual high five, Twain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you've though. crossed over to the crazy chicken lady side. You've hit a new plateau when you start incubating. And mm -hmm. I think, Mark, you've been incubating, haven't you? I yeah, think you yeah. That last plateau. year we did. Yeah. We did. Yeah. It is yeah. so addictive. It is so addictive. It is. I did uh, Mankin Bantams in the incubator, which was an amazing experience. God, I, I don't know that I can handle geese in the incubator, though. 
Do geese hmm. need any hmm. vaccines? I didn't even think about that. Are there any vaccines for geese? Uh, I'm, you know, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure either. Waterfowl can get coccidiosis. I'll be honest with you. I have never seen one get it because it just seems like their immune systems are so tough. I just don't. They're tough. Yeah. 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 I mean, when you think about it for like avian flu, there are a lot of the carriers and they don't get it. They carry it from place to place, but they don't get it. Yeah. So let's move in to. I want this questions for Twain. Now he does this thing across the country, which is so cool called chick days or chick nights. And a lot of the farm supply stores have you in and our, the mill is one of the the stores that has you in. That's our local feed store. And, talks about everything that you need and we're kind of really excited to be joining you this year over at chick night tell Uh, us a little bit about that Uh, it's it's just such a fun thing that you do for the public that uh, neutrina does well the mill puts on a real class show they they have a lot of refreshments and stuff and then it's just a live venue and i will do a presentation but usually i try to make it super fun and engaging and it's th- those are my best when people are asking me questions and it's engaging and we have a lot of fun with those. And I was wrong. It's not March. That'll be the first week of April is when. I'll yes. So. Yeah. So our dates um, will make it. Yes. And usually they have a big attendance. And so the more people you have, the more likely you're going to get a lot more questions. I love the questions. That's the funnest part. And no, I, I get stumped. On a regular basis. I don't always know the answer to everything. And I'll I'll tell you, I don't know. I, I won't try and fake it. So <laughs> so tell us what's one of the most common questions that you're gonna get from someone Whoa. who's just starting out, they're gonna get their chicks at their local farm supply store and they ask you what's well, one of- I could do a segue into a stupid chicken story, but sure. Um, Let's do okay. it. All right. So I normally travel with a trained rooster. As fascinating as I think I am to a five-year-old, not so much, but a rooster that's trained to stand on a block in front of a crowd (laughs) or that one with my Bantams, I I had old English game Bantams and I would use them as a pointer. I would, you know, carry them and I'd point to the screen. And and the most common (laughs) question I used to get was, how does that thing not crap on you? How do you keep that bird from crapping on you? So uh, picture... Racing 4-H here in Wisconsin, we had about 150 people, parents, kids, and this kid asks me that. And I said, oh, well, this is a teachable moment. So all these kids take out their notepads. I'm like, oh, well, that's not really what I meant, but okay. (laughs) And I said, a chicken, I said, well, here's your homework. When you go home and they're writing this down, I said, I want you to watch your chickens go to the bathroom. When a chicken poops, they kind of squat before they go. So if their feet are not on the ground, they can't go to the bathroom. So I can hold this chicken. As long as I don't set him down, he's not going to poop on me. So then, of course, me just being me, you know, the little devil on the shoulder pops up and I <laughs> I continued on. And I said, so in 4-H, is it still the same way that the little kids start with the, with the poultry and then the older kids get other species and they're kind of mean to the poultry kids? And all the kids nodded and applauded. (laughs) Yes, this is true. And I said, well, when I was your age, what I would do is I would take my favorite chicken and carry it around for about an hour. Chickens poop about every 20 minutes. So I would carry this chicken around for about an hour and find one of these older kids that was mean to me. And I'd say, hey, can you hold Betty for a minute? And I'd set Betty in their lap. Mm -hmm. And on cue, Betty had just (laughs) unload a great big wet right on them (laughs) so fast forward the kids all laughed they thought this was great so fast forward a year racing 4-h again and i'm giving this presentation and before i can get started this woman stands up and says i have a bone to pick with you like oh crap well i I don't really have a filter on my mouth so i'm like oh god this could be anything you know and she starts to tell me about how they had all these kids at the fair that had great big green and brown stains on their white pants. And she's, I mean, she is about to tear me a new one. And all the kids started applauding and they clapped and they, they cheered her down and she sat down. But uh, so that was my teachable moment. Yeah. I mean, you can hold them and you kind of know, and they're, they're trainable too. Right. So only the, the only ones that really poop on you a lot are the chicks because they're too young to know 
and you and can kind of you're holding them with their feet get purchased and they they can squat poop. exactly but the older ones they still start to wiggle a little bit it's kind of yeah. like oh i'm i gotta go you put them down they go and you pick them back up it's so great but <laughs> the chick nights i just think it's the best service to go out there to the community and teach people before you even get your chicks yep. And make it a fun thing. Now, I want to know what kind of refreshments the mill's going to put on this year since we're going to be there. It but- <laughs> depends. They, sometimes they put on like a full dinner, like wow. like sandwiches and stuff. I mean, That's uh, awesome. they, they, they're pretty class organizations. So, and, and all joking aside, I know I got off on a tangent there. My most common questions are usually, how long does a chicken live? That's a real common one. How many should I get? And I usually don't even hesitate. I tell them 76. That's a perfect number. <laughs> <laughs> and then um how many eggs will they lay do i need a roost this one's the the one that still baffles me do i, I want to get chickens but i can't have a rooster it doesn't make sense our ordinance says we can have chickens but no roosters and i want eggs okay but you don't need the rooster to get eggs and then they want to argue with you and it's like okay you didn't pay attention in biology did you <laughs> so those yeah. are my most common ones. So I, I want to give a quick shout out to Twain. So I just got out of a meeting with a, a bunch of other uh, chicken industry folks, and there was a comment made, and everybody nodded their head in this meeting. But one of the folks in the meeting made the comment that Twain was the original chicken influencer before there even was such a thing as an influencer. Oh, and yeah. everybody in that meeting, everybody agreed, said, yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've been doing it since the 90s. I've been getting people started with chickens in the early 90s. So it's been <laughs> going around. I'm not, I'm probably not by far the best known. There are several that are better known than me, but I do appreciate that. That's pretty- well. If you if you end up with your dad's rooster that he won in a poker game with <laughs> one game. eye, yep. that yep. makes you the OG, the goat. Yeah, yeah. Right. Come uh, on now. Yeah. You know, I just love what you do. I love your personality with everybody, your stories, everything. But I just want to put this out there because we've been getting so much feedback. And it's so true that you guys each have your own flocks and how much you actually really love keeping chickens Mm -hmm. and that says a lot because you're in this for yourselves too you know because you have chicken flocks and you love them and you hug them and you said you've been hugging them a little bit more since you met us (laughs) i know i have that that is right i have hugged them a little more since we met you guys it's addictive it is okay you see a lot of information about how to feed baby waterfowl it looks like you can feed chick feed but add niacin in I'm kind of a helicopter mom, though, and I would be nervous that if I was just putting an additive on the food, they wouldn't get it. So what is the best complete waterfowl food for babies? Mark, you yeah, check that one. Okay. You bet. Sure can. Yeah. So uh, here just a few years ago, we worked on a, um, a feed just specifically for that. The fastest growing segment of backyard poultry is ducks. So you know, as we're set down and kind of going through our some of our ideas about what we should look at coming out with next, Twain was really promoting the idea that, you know, guys, we really need to do sit down and, and get a, a true duck starter. And so in our country feed lines, we have our duck and all flock starter feed. And that is absolutely the best duck starter feed out there. And that... Um, that product is put together for ducks specifically, but it also works for some of the other uh, game fowl, you know, to start some of them and and whatnot. So definitely it's higher in protein and amino acids, has the, the balance of the, the correct level of niacin in there. And then also just some of the trace minerals are also different than what a chicken requires besides the, the calcium phosphorus levels. So great, great feed. The country feeds duck and all flock starter. It's also that- formulated for lower mycotoxins. Yep. Mycotoxins are the fungus that occurs in grains. So when you have a bad or a stressed year on your grains, you get more mycotoxins. Chickens and turkeys handle that pretty well. You get into things like pheasants and quail, not so much. And ducks are hypersensitive to it. 
So we formulated all of our duck feed, the starter and the adult food, to be lower in mycotoxins. So Wow. Yep. Does this count for goslings as well? Yeah. A waterfowl are just more sensitive yep. to uh, um, mycotoxins. So. Okay. That's good to know. Where you really see that is if you, and I'm sure you will, start incubating your, your waterfowl eggs. Um, <laughs> mycotoxins can have a of very negative... Of course, Elliot will. Of course. Of course you will. I, I, I know this. <laughs> You, it has a very negative effect on hatch rates. So that oh, okay. is, and and mycotoxins and starter feed will kill your your ducklings and your goslings, or it can. So it's very important that you have that low mycotoxin levels. Fantastic. Wow. Okay. That is good. such good information. Really yeah. good information to know. I mean, it it is much easier to buy something that's completely formulated the way mm-hmm. it should be, and then you just put it out there versus, okay, I need to add a little of this, a little of that, and to get it to where it needs to be. So it's the way to go. Geese especially like to eat off floating food. So that nourishing is going to be real. That's going to be the go-to goose feed. It really great. will be. That's fantastic. I love this. Okay, great. So we're going to end this up with a question because this one is one that a lot of people who are new to chicks and chickens don't always know the answer to. And it's when to make the switch from that chick feed to layer feed. And it's kind of, you know, I guess the answer is in in the feeds. But why don't we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Go well, ahead. I was going to say, I like to, to kind of go backwards a little bit. The common mistake a lot of people make is they wait till they see the first egg to go to a layer feed. And the reason that's a mistake is that the baby chick feed has very little, if any, calcium in it. So Betty needs to build up the calcium in her system before she actually starts laying. So 16 weeks, she will more than likely start laying at 20 to 22 weeks. So she's had time to build that calcium up. I also like to see him take home a bag of oyster shell with that first bag and I, I'm a big fan of putting it in a separate dish. I don't like mixing it in the food because then you're forcing calcium into a bird that doesn't need it. And if they have roosters, this is especially important because he definitely doesn't need that calcium, that extra calcium. So Yeah, we've talked about it a lot on different episodes. There's really neat little separate dispensers or feeders that you yeah. can hook around your runs to put that oyster shell and make it available to the chickens who know they need it at the time and give them that option. Because believe it or not, chickens are highly intelligent and they know themselves. They know when they need instinctually, they know when they need more calcium, they know when they don't, and they'll take it as they need it. But having that available along with the feed. So you're saying around 16 weeks of age should be start to mix and switch over so that they get ready for that to lay that first egg and the, the shell's nice and hard. Yeah, if you can, if you can, you can start just kind of making that gradual transition over a few days and, and transition that over to the layer feed, uh, especially if you're feeding a pellet too. So if you go from a crumble to a mm. pellet, it's kind of nice to transition that over a couple of days. Yeah, the big benefit of making sure you do that is when you get them switched over at 16 weeks now, you've gone to where you're starting to prep that young pullet or young hand now into laying. So you're adding more of the calcium. You're adding more of the other minerals that she needs. You're essentially switching the feed from feeding for growth of the bird to where you're feeding primarily to apply the correct nutrients for reproduction in that young hand. So that way, when she does lay that first small egg, it's not an egg that cracks or is broke, you know, when you first find it. You know, you don't have to worry about those thin, thin shells because you've actually prepped her to start to lay. That makes perfect sense. It makes really perfect sense. And the thing is that, you know, you want to keep that nutrition going because... Bullet eggs actually have a tendency to even be richer in some of the things in the very beginning right. and have even a better taste. A lot of people say that the pullet eggs have a, a better, richer taste in the beginning. And it's that transition from going from chick feed, high protein to the layer feed at that point. 
Yeah. Well, the other thing yeah, with that, we, those brittle eggs is you do not want Betty to find out what's inside that egg. No. <laughs> because once Betty finds out, guess what? It's on the menu. And Betty's going to tell mm-hmm. all her friends. And we and, do not want that to happen at Twain's uh-uh. house. And uh-uh. this <laughs> is, it is right behind predation as your top reasons people get out of the hobby. Predation's number one. That is the number one reason they can't keep the raccoons, whatever, coyotes out of their flock. The number two reason is, man, I raised these chickens up and the rotten things started eating eggs and then they couldn't break them of eating the eggs. Because it it's much so much easier to prevent it than it is to break them of that habit. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. definitely not a Twain's house. You do not want that uh-uh. soft egg oh, in the no. beginning. <laughs> not, not with my <laughs> wife around. It's just, He catches an egg eater and it's off to Camp Kenmore. <laughs> Do not want to wait. Uh-uh. Not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not good. Not good. That mean rooster only attacks her once, too. <laughs> Twain, I, I'm with Mark. Twain better watch himself over there. He's I, I know it. <laughs> okay. It's awesome always having you guys on. You give such great information. Neutrina has such amazing products out there. We love talking about them. We love spreading the word. Feather Fixer, amazing. Nature Wise, amazing. All of them. High Pro Scratch, one of my faves. Keep selling out at the mill. Come on, get them back in. And (laughs) just love your products. They're really high quality. And I love the fact that they're high quality, but not high prices so you know you can afford them and you know that's really good stuff in there the next level next level up stuff and it's less expensive than boutique brands so it's amazing love that and and then when we actually when we put formulas together uh it is extremely important for us to make sure that with that nutrition it actually costs you less in the long run to feed nature wise because you will get more eggs, you will get faster growing chicks. Yep, that is definitely something we really look at. So once again, thank you guys so much for coming on. We'll see you again in a few months and uh, take care. Okay, so everybody, we'll talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. everybody. See ya. We just want to thank Mark and Twain one more time for a really great conversation. I learned stuff I didn't know before. How about you, Chris? I thought it was an excellent conversation and Mark and Twain bring so much to the table. And what I love is that they work for one of the largest feed companies in the world and they love their chickens and they have their chickens. Yes. Just love them. Okay. So are we ready to move on to cracking the eggs, cracking those eggs. Now we're getting ready for spring here. We want spring. So you know, somehow we try to get it into our recipes a little bit here and there because, man, we need spring. We need it. Well, we went for something fresh and bright. We went for lemon meringue pie. Oh, yeah. I will tell you, this pie is absolutely delicious, and it looks a lot harder to make than it really is. And it's one of my mother's most favorite is lemon meringue pie. Mine, too. My mom loves lemon stuff. Maybe it's something generational, like they had it a lot. I don't know. But well, when I was little, my mom loved it and I hated it. But now I love it. So love a meringue pie. Now, to make things easier, we are skipping the pastry crust and we're making an easy graham cracker and coconut press in crust. I've been using this crust for years. It's one of my favorites. It's a way to go because sometimes the graham crust is just it's so much easier. It's so yummy. Yeah. And you throw coconut in with it. And if you don't like coconut, just take the coconut out. But you can actually, instead of the coconut, you could put some finely chopped nuts or some almond flour in there. It would work just as well. Yeah. And the thing is, whenever I meringue anything now, I think back to high school cooking class and how they taught us how to make meringue. So it always takes me back to that. Interesting. Okay, let's go into the ingredients that we're going to need for this fabulous crust that's going to be easy, yummy, and a little different. You're going to well over your friends. Three quarters of a cup of graham cracker crumbs. Or gluten-free graham cracker crumbs. Either or. Three quarters of a cup of shredded coconut. A third of a cup of sugar. A quarter cup, which is four tablespoons, of unsalted butter or dairy-free butter. Melt it. Four large egg yolks. Reserve the whites for the meringue. One 14-ounce can of sweetened condensed milk. Minus four tablespoons 
or one can of dairy-free sweetened condensed coconut or oat milk, one teaspoon of packed finely grated lemon zest from one lemon, a half a cup of fresh lemon juice squeezed from about three lemons. Okay. You can also get it out of a bottle too. We're not going to judge you. I have those little bottles in the fridge. They don't last because I Ella just goes in and drinks it straight out of the bottle. Oh my. <laughs> yes, she does. Wow. Okay. And that's the final ingredients for the meringue are four large egg whites that you reserve from when you used it for the other side, six tablespoons of sugar, a quarter teaspoon of cream of tartar. You always need this for your meringue pies. You're going to preheat your oven to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. You want a medium mixing bowl. Mix together the graham crackers, the coconut, and the sugar. Pour the melted butter on it and stir it with a fork until it starts to come together. Then you can use your hands to really get in there and mix it. Using your fingers or the bottom of a small glass, you can press the crumbs firmly into the bottom and up the sides of the pie pan. And I'm going to tell you. I like the graham cracker crust better than a regular crust for any pie, to be honest. I really like graham cracker crust. But I got to tell you, sometimes if I'm feeling lazy, I just mix it all right in the pie pan. I don't even care. Yeah, it's so easy. And I really think it's even more yummy than a regular crust. It is. I should say I used a deep dish pan for this, just a deep dish pie pan for this. I tend to use a deep dish for every pie I make because for some reason, they're never a small pie. It never ends up being small. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't really doesn't. So you're going to put the crust into that oven, bake it for about 10 minutes until it's just starting to turn golden brown. Take it out of the oven and set aside. And then you want to lower the oven temperature to 325. In another medium mixing bowl, whisk together those egg yolks, your sweetened condensed milk, the lemon zest, and the lemon juice. Just mix it really well together. Once it's all blended, pour that into that pie crust. Then it's meringue time. It's high school meringue time. Let's go. Your egg whites, your sugar, and your cream of tartar. Put them all into a large mixing bowl or the bowl of a stand mixer if you'd rather use a stand mixer. You're going to beat these over medium-high heat until the egg whites get thick and glossy and are mostly holding peaks. You don't want it really, really stiff. Right. If you pull up a peak, it kind of curves over a little bit. Right. You're going to transfer all that meringue to the top of the filling in the pie dish. Use a small spatula. You're going to spread it out all the way to the edges so that it's against the edge of the crust of the pan. And the reason you want to do this is because you're creating a seal with the meringue. It can shrink if you don't have it anchored. Right. Then you want to take like a small spoon or a small spatula, make some pretty swirls and waves in your meringue. And you're going to pop it back in the oven. Double check and make sure your oven is at 325. You're going to bake it about 20 minutes until your meringue, again, is getting golden brown on the top. Don't have your heat too high. And don't forget about your pie because that meringue can go from delicious to scorched. Before I was going to say, it's so important. This is one of those things. Sometimes 350, 325, 375, it doesn't matter as much. But for when you're making meringues, it really does. It does. You have to have the lower heat. You need a lower heat, yeah. So if you prefer your pie cool, I would chill this for a few hours in the fridge or even overnight. Some people find that it slices better and they like the whole thing cool. I like mine cold. I do too. I like my meringue cold too. The fun thing about this pie is that you can play with the crust a little bit. You can add or subtract whatever you want in there. The other thing is if you don't want to make this a lemon curd, you can make it lime curd. You can make it blood orange. You could make it clementine, really whatever citrus you want. Right. Exactly. So try it. You might like it. Take it to your bestie's house for a lunch, have coffee, eat a slice of lemon meringue pie. It's bright and delicious for spring, but it's also kind of impressive. Like you can show off your culinary chops a little bit with a lemon meringue pie. Oh yeah. I mean, definitely. Look what I made. Yeah. Okay. So try it. You might like it. Send us some pictures. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. This week's retail therapy, you found this farm, and then I had found the farm also, but I wasn't aware of the farm that you had sent me. So we both kind of found it on our own. I don't know. It was weird, but it's really cool. So this is Blue Stallion Farm, which is owned by a woman who does have a farm and she's kind of made a whole lifestyle brand. It's really cool stuff. 
So the website is kind of like a destination website. You can see photos of the owner's horses and chickens and beautiful farm. It's really nice. And the farm was established in 2012, it says on the website. Right. What got us is their Instagram because, you know, we're always on there looking, but they have a beautiful Instagram with beautiful chicken dishes. Right. Right. The dishes are lovely. And you can buy them. They come in sets. So you can get a set of four dessert dishes, a set of four dinner dishes, and they do feature chickens. Other farmyard animals too, but they do feature chickens in there. They're very pretty. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. I was looking on the website. There's also a cookbook that you can purchase from them too. They also have really lovely market bags, you know, a tote bag you would take to the farmer's market. Oh, yeah. Kind of a twill style and they do feature a chicken on there. Very pretty. Now, they do have guava, jasmine, and banyan trees on their farm. Banyan trees? Oh, because they're in the south. Yeah. Okay. So They could have some kubalayas. They could. (laughs) And they have ponies, pigs, chickens. It says here, a ragtag team of adorable pups. Oh. So they really live the lifestyle that's out on this. Like you said, they live their brand that they've created. Right. It's very, it's very much a lifestyle brand. Yeah, it is. The website is definitely a destination and the dishes are so pretty. Yes. Oh, they have a peacock on there too. Oh, I didn't see the peacock. That's neat. Yeah. And you can get like soaps and lotions and everything else that they make from everything on the farm. And I love places like this that live their brand. I love that. It's lovely. I have them linked in the show notes. You can go over and check it out. See if you want to buy yourself some pretty stuff. I'm going over. I need to buy some pretty stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are spotlighting a really, really special heritage breed, the Icelandic chicken. Ooh, can't wait. We are catching up with the girls over at Greenfire Farm. We're going to talk about their chick sexing videos and some other new stuff they have over there. Love talking to them. They're so sweet over there. It's, it's a lot of fun. Cracking the eggs. We're doing a really delicious omelet salad. This is not what you think it is. You need to hear this recipe. And we're keeping it a little lighter if you want to go healthier these days. Retail Therapy, another lifestyle brand that has some really gorgeous chicken stuff, Sipsy Wilder. It's woman owned. And that's what we love also. Okay. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.